Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm Ryan Lozano from the Department of Language, Philosophy, and Culture here at San Antonio College. And uh, today is the fifth annual special edition Halloween lecture. Uh, today we're looking at zombies, separating fact from fiction. Hopefully it's a little bit of fun. Now, not that kind of zombie. I was originally uh, going to hold this lecture on a Monday morning at 8 a.m., but I figured that might be a little too thematic and scary for all of us. But uh, zombies, especially on the silver screen, have fascinated us as audiences for decades. And when I first started putting together this lecture, I wanted to find out why that was and how much of what makes it into the movies is actual, factual, zombie-type stuff. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at. Now, the first actual zombie movie was White Zombie. No, not that White Zombie. That's yeah. Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie borrowed the name from White Zombie. This is from 1932, starring Bela Lugosi, the star of the previous year's smash hit Dracula, as Murder Legendre, a white Haitian voodoo master who commands a horde of zombies. It was filmed in just 11 days with a budget of $50,000, uh, considered kind of a shoestring budget even then, and Lugosi commanded a staggering salary of $900. It was cast mostly with silent era has-beens. It was one of the earliest talkies, and was then a critical failure, but has since become a cult classic. This is kind of the archetype and model of all of the zombie flicks since. Now, the effects are not particularly scary, as you can tell. One reviewer noted at the time that the shambling masses at Lugosi's command look more like an unorganized rehearsal of a chorus line from Gilbert and Sullivan. Thirty-six years later, George Romero turned the genre on its head, Night of the Living Dead, the first zombie movie to depict them as cannibalistic cadavers, something that seems to have stuck in uh, the popular imagination. He would follow up that effort with Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, Diary of the Dead, and Survival of the Dead. Not to mention the extra canonical effort on his part, Creepshow, which does feature some zombie-like creatures, so we're going to go ahead and include that one. 1984, Surf 2, uh, not necessarily the gold standard of quality in film, and 1993's Ozone, would inject a little bit of realism into the genre as a drink and a drug, respectively, or what turned folks into zombies. A little more on that later on. There have been comedic efforts put forth, like Shaun of the Dead and Juan of the Dead, Army of Darkness, and Cabin in the Woods, where we're reminded, especially, that uh, one must make a very careful distinction between zombies and a zombie redneck torture family. You don't want to confuse the two things with one another. There have even been a few attempts to get youngsters in on it with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island and Paranorman, which was described in, at its release as a zombie movie for kids. Now, it goes without saying, so let's just say it anyway, that the popularity of The Walking Dead, both in the graphic novel and television format, has been remarkable. Uh, an interesting philosophical aside, I think, since this is the Department of Philosophy, is it also provides a handily familiar example of Hobbes' state of nature. It turns out in that post-apocalyptic zombie future, life really is nasty, solitary, brutish, poor and short. Now, the board gaming world has developed a similar fascination with zombies, almost all of them of the Romero variety. Uh, that is to say, former humans now fixated on eating brains, with Zombie Side, Last Night on Earth, Dead of Winter, as featured on Will Wheaton's tabletop, and even a high school setting, uh, the fantastic Student Bodies by Smirk and Dagger Games. These are just the tip of the iceberg, as this theme is stretched to every imaginable product placement, all reasonably and conveniently free of intellectual property restrictions. But that's a separate philosophical issue. So, we all know the lore, but where does all this zombie lore come from? And how did this whole thing get started? Are we really going to trace it to a 1932 movie that flopped, or is there something a little bit more behind it? Now, to get at its origins, we've got to talk a little bit, okay, a lot, 
about voodoo and about not its origins necessarily in a horror flick fodder, but as a world religion still very much alive, still very presently practiced in parts of the world. Now, to begin with, voodoo and hoodoo are not the same. Both do have their origins in West Africa, specifically in Benin, uh, right next to uh, Nigeria. Voodoo is a corruption of the word vodou. Okay. It's a West African religion, still practiced there, but more familiar to us in its diasporic form as it came over with the slave trade. Uh, it was influenced by and created a syncretism with French Catholicism, primarily in Haiti, where it continues as an established and respected religion, liturgically practiced, usually in the Creole dialect of Haitian French. Hoodoo, that which is known in Africa as Gukabol, and here more commonly called root work or conjure, is not a religion. It is a form of folk magic that places more emphasis on personal magical power invoked through the use of certain items, spells, formula, or methods, and it ascribes magical properties to roots, to uh, animal parts, to minerals, to herbs, personal possessions, and the notion with hoodoo is generally one of harnessing the supernatural to improve life within the natural. Now, there is our hoodoo being practiced. To further confuse things, we have Vodun. Vodun is a distinctly American Southern form of voodoo and closer in practice to what we see uh, depicted in most films and television series. When you see the voodoo practitioners in Supernatural or Skeleton Key and Serpent in the Rainbow and Angel Heart, they're bringing in not only practices of West African voodoo, but also Southern folk magic, that's the hoodoo, aspects of hagiographical Catholicism, Native American practices, and it tends to have a less regimented liturgical life uh, than proper voodoo does, but it features a lot of what we might be culturally familiar with. Uh, Grigris, that's talismans or amulets, Wanga, those are the famous or infamous uh, voodoo dolls, mojo bags, and other things. So, back to zombies. In Haitian voodoo superstition, a zombie is a dead body, usually reanimated by magical means, to act as a soulless robot under the control of a ungam, a voodoo priest. Here, by the way, is Bela Lugosi as Murder Legendre in White Zombie. Here are a couple of gods that have made their way into comic books and a few other places. Now, you would become a zombie at the hands of one of these gods in a couple of different ways. Either they would dig up a corpse and reanimate them through a magic ritual, or more likely, they would feed their victim a special preparation that would stupefy the soul, leaving the body a living corpse and subject to their suggestion and direction. More on that momentarily. As is common across both hoodoo and voodoo, where there is a curse, there's usually a reciprocal cure, or sometimes there are several. Now, the simplest one seems to have uh, been giving the zombies salt water to drink. Sometimes it would have to do with their burial methodology. The corpse would be buried face down or have its mouth filled with consecrated earth, as in from a cemetery, graveyard dirt is one of those frequently encountered hoodoo ingredients. Sometimes a knife would be placed in the hand so it could defend itself against the evil witch doctor wanting to uh, zombify it. Sometimes handfuls of sesame seeds would be strewn on the ground over the grave so the zombie would be too preoccupied counting them to bother anyone. Uh, this is something uh, that they share with Eastern European vampire folklore, and that's why we have Count von Count. <laughs> Two, three, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Now, that is uh, some of the prevention techniques. The accounts of zombies, zombies are fairly common in Haiti, and some of the stories are just really great. Uh, in 1939, we have the first appearance of a now classic and frequently adapted and adopted account of a young girl from a wealthy family who was discovered four years after her natural death working as a slave in a shop. This is not at all uncommon. This is what the philosophy department looks like Monday mornings at about 8 a.m. 
rescued and revived by French nuns and placed in a convent to live out her unnatural life. By 1915, the story was still popular, but it had adapted a little bit. By this point, we have four or five different towns named as the place of her discovery. Uh, her rescuers have in some cases become Baptist missionaries. And my favorite twist, pun intended, on the story is that she was identified due to her bent neck, the result of having been buried in a coffin that was too small for her. And she had a scar on her foot from where the candle had overturned during her wake. One account relates a whole horde of zombies maintained by a hungan named Joseph, whose wife ignorantly fed them salted biscuits. In Haiti, most of the salt that they use is evaporated from seawater. And they awoke, and they made straight for the cemetery, hurling themselves upon their graves, and trying to dig themselves back into the earth, turning into corpses even as they did so. Uh, the famous caged graves of the Victorian era are one example of preventing them from getting out in the first place or leaving them in peace. But how do you keep them from getting back in if they encounter salted biscuits or salt water? Now, the greatest fear of the zombie owner, and yes, there actually were manuals for zombie ownership, seems to have been that a zombie, once freed from their bondage, would revenge themselves physically and magically upon their captor. Because of this, zombie owners treated them very harshly, something borrowed over from the Haitian practice of beating lunatics to keep them frightened. Philosophical sidebar, Foucault would have had a field day with this. <laughs> so, back to how one makes a zombie. As a caveat, San Antonio College, the Elba Colleges, do not convey the making of zombies at home, so please do not try this at home. <laughs> Remember, zombies are made either by enchantment or by poison. The former's a bit mysterious. I, I have no enchantments to impart to you today, known only to the Hungans, such as they are. So we'll stick to the latter. The plants, usually cited as poison, are manchineal, an apple-like fruit up there, used by slaves to kill plantation owners and their livestock, uh, and datura, the thorn apple, which contains, nobody be writing this down, it's great, which contains atropine, or sometimes belladonna, deadly nightshade. Of course, the most powerful poison, known to whom gods, is that which is made from the legendary three drops that escape from the nose of a corpse when he's hung upside down. I have no pictures for Sarah. <laughs> there are also preparations of powders containing pepperwood, which stimulates the mucous membranes when inhaled, and it triggers a sort of disassociation which renders the subject highly suggestible, as they might be during a ritual or ceremony. Initiates into the ranks of the Hungan Voodoo priesthood undergo something very similar, but with proper safeguards in place. Their souls get transferred into a head pot, safe from attacks by evil magicians and under protection of the Voodoo gods. At their death, a rite called the Desuin sends their spirits into the waters of death and their souls back into the head pot to await spiritual resurrection. The deceased initiates are therefore a sort of purified zombie whose activity, when possessed, is controlled not by a moon god, but by one of the voodoo gods, apparently a safer proposition. Now, in 1984, a bit of the mystery was removed, and by extension, a bit of the fun. BBC television, uh, presented a program by John Tusa featured in an interview with a Hungan who admitted to using the poison of the puffer fish. Diodon Hystrix carefully prepared and administered to their victim who would then appear to be dead, apparently and appropriately buried, only to be exhumed by the Hungan and used as a zombie. Now, neurobiologists have analyzed the pufferfish poison and identified it as a pterodotoxin, exactly what is found in Japanese fufu, requiring a skilled sushi chef to prepare in order to avoid poisoning diners. When eaten raw, that is sashimi, the flesh is relatively safe, with a mortality rate significantly less than when the dish is partly cooked and includes the livers, said to be the tastiest part of the fish despite the risks and the only food that the Emperor of Japan is forbidden from eating. 
Now there are about 100 deaths annually, worldwide. Now, there are 17 restaurants in the United States that are licensed to serve fugu. 12 of them are in New York City. This makes the likelihood of a zombie outbreak within the Big Apple much more likely and perhaps more believable than a zombie outbreak in Georgia, with apologies to the producers of The Walking Dead. <laughs> what it does tell us is we here in Texas are relatively safe from zombie apocalypse. Good news. And that's about it. Are there any questions that I can answer for you? How do you spell the name? Uh, you said Tusu, the BBC guy who was interviewed with and revealed about the cuttlefish. Is that T-U-S-A? Uh, Tusa. T-U-S-A. Yes. Um, is it always the case that they have to uh, be dead or can it be somebody who's died? I was just reading this book about um, tuberculosis and conception in literature. Mm -hmm. And it said that sometimes uh, people would have to make a moral decision about whether or not they were going to become infected by caring for somebody who has a fatal disease. Therefore, they're almost saying, you know, like, then I agree to become oh, sure. you know, part of this group of people who are going to die very soon. Well, I don't know that I encountered anyone in the literature that uh, voluntarily became zombified. Uh, except maybe in the, the, the voodoo priests themselves undergoing that, that similar ritual, I guess the risk would be taken. But uh, no, for the most part, they, they don't appear to have to be dead. They could be poisoned with the, uh, the machineal or the, uh, the drops from the corpse's nose or any of those other techniques. But sometimes they were already dead and then resurrected magically is what, what shows up in the, uh, in the writings. Yeah, so what is their purpose? What well, is the zombie's purpose? Well, you'll note that that posture is about perfect for mowing a lawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the purpose generally seems to have been just having a having someone at your beck and call. Oh, okay. They're, they're your personal slave servant to do so whatever. They don't necessarily want to kill you. No. Now there were some stories that in in some of the uh, the Haitian military coups that some of the soldiers were actually thought to possibly be zombies under control of the, uh, of the military leader. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I just want to say yes. line. I mean, so we get, you know, the we're 32 the white zombie, and then Romero was 68. 68, yeah, okay. So Remade in 90. So we get, I mean, we get this, you know, almost 40 year gap, and it seems like in, the, in white zombie, I haven't seen it, but it seems to be that they're essentially, you know, under the control of a particular, you know, doctor. So this this shift from they're at the beck and call of some mischievous mastermind versus they're these, you know, to whatever degree sort of self whatever, you know, sure. brain eating monsters. I mean, is is there is there a either historical or whatever sort of explanation is to There doesn't happen. seem to be any interlocutor, either um, cinematic or otherwise. Uh, Romero just kind of went off the reservation with the, uh, no, in fact, they're fleshing <laughs> yeah. eating cadavers. And it makes for a better film, I suppose. I'm a white zombie. I encourage you all to see it. it it's available on Netflix. Uh, and it's, it's a fairly slow hour and a half if you're used to contemporary <laughs> horror films, and the zombies are not particularly intimidating. They just kind of shuffle around and you know grunt a little bit here and there, but they're not interested in your brains, and uh, they're they're not particularly terrifying, and they all just kind of move together in a horde. By the time we get updated to Romero, now, well now they're coming at you at a pretty good clip, and now they're interested in eating you, so it's a little more terrifying, but. I couldn't find anything that, uh, and obviously the literature on this is pretty limited, but um, there wasn't anything that indicated that that is, is canonical in any way. It's become very much so, because now we don't think of you know, a zombie that doesn't want brains we're talking about. But it um, doesn't seem to have come from anywhere specific. Yeah. In terms of the, uh, of the root work, the conjure, the hoodoo, as it's so-called, uh, there really is kind of a major work on that. It was compiled in the 1970s 
uh, by Harry Middleton Hyatt. Uh, he was a Methodist minister that went into the American South and started interviewing uh, witch doctors, for lack of a better word, and he records this in a 5,000 word uh, work called Kudu, Root Work, and Conjure. Uh, I want to say it's, it's available online in a couple different places. It's been out of print since the 70s, but you can still find reproductions of it. And uh, a lot of the uh, practices that I recorded here are recorded in that text there. Yes, sir. Oh, just one thing. Uh, I guess I did it for, for fun. The uh, website for the CDC has a little side, sidebar to zombies. Oh, so right. That's awesome. It's on a government website, so I just thought that was funny. <laughs> Slightly track Santa Claus every year. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, no, show them down. Brought me a new bike last year. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, was the idea of the apocalypse in it from the beginning too? I kind of missed that. Or did that come later? The apocalypse. No, zombie apocalypse. Oh, um, no, that, that seems to have uh, come about kind of around uh, another invention of George Romero. Uh, almost all of what we now think of as zombies comes from 1968. It comes from that one fellow. They want to eat your brain. They are now dead. Uh, they're not really under control. They don't really have any thought at all. Uh, and as far as an apocalyptic kind of uh, post-apocalyptic future, the, that seems to have come about there. All for one movie? <laughs> well, wow. from six movies, counting all of his uh, his various None sequels. None of these filmmakers do research. <laughs> Sorry, that was a good question. They did it for inconvenient truth. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> you told me that they were created as a personal slave, so how did they turn into brain wanting to kill you? Well, as to Dr. Toon's question, it, it kind of, he seems to have just uh, gone off his own way and made that leap, and it's, so it's it certainly like makes it's for a more interesting film. Yeah, sure, certainly. Yeah. I don't know. In your research, did you was there any correlation with frontal lobotomies and zombies? From, uh... Uh, only to the extent of the treatment of the patients. Um, you know, the the sideline to Foucault, uh, you know, madness and civilization, with, is definitely there. Uh, in terms of in the era of the prefrontal lobotomy, we do start to see the just horrific treatment of patients, um, especially within Victorian England. Uh, the sanatoriums and sanitariums that are there. Um, as far as a direct connection to zombies, I haven't noted one, but uh, I'm sure. They're left in a zombie like wrong. state after their lobotomies. They're left in a zombie like state. Yes. I mean, they were. Not, I'm not, it's not done anymore, but just. But without the seeking. Yes. No brains. No brains. <laughs> Well, I thank you all. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do every year. Like I said, this is the fifth time I've done this. Uh, we keep having fun, so we're going to keep doing it. But uh, enjoy the candy. Thank you for coming. And uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to see.